All right, in the last part of today's lecture, I'm going to discuss a few concluding details about autoencoders, and then I'll begin the discussion of latent variable models, which will continue into Wednesday. So first, what I want to tell you guys about, and this is really a little bit of a, of a historical uh, kind of uh, summary, is uh, how autoencoders were actually used in the early days of deep learning. This technique called layer-wise pre-training was actually one of the things that galvanized the modern study of deep learning around 2006. It's not as widely used today, but I think it's important to know about because these ideas do come up again and again in, in some areas. Uh, so mostly this will be uh, kind of for, uh, for your own understanding. It's probably not something that you're going to use uh, if you actually want to train deep models, but it's good to know about. So one of the early uh, widespread uses of autoencoders and the reason that they are you know, so important in the study of deep learning was for this thing called layer-wise pre-training. And layer-wise pre-training was essentially how we could train very deep neural networks without having to do backpropagation through all of its layers. The idea was the following. Start out with some uh, input, like an image, and train a small autoencoder on that image using something like denoising or sparsity. So this autoencoder might have maybe three or four, to, or, you know, maybe let's say two to four layers, not, not very deep, uh, and it's going to learn some hidden representation denoted with this blue rectangle. And then we're going, after we train this autoencoder, we're going to encode all of the uh, images in our training set and get their corresponding hidden states represented by blue rectangles. And then we'll train another autoencoder on these blue hidden states. So the green autoencoder just uses the blue hidden states as input and output. It does not look at the original images at all. And it has another hidden state, the green hidden state. And this green autoencoder is also relatively shallow, maybe two to four layers. And then we'll train another autoencoder that uses the green hidden state as input and output, and now it gets another, let's say, purple hidden state. And the idea is that if each time we train an autoencoder, we make the representation a little bit more abstract, a little bit more disentangled, maybe a little bit lossy, then the combination of all the encoders of these autoencoders will encode the original image into a much more abstract representation. So then when we want to use uh, these models to solve some downstream task will actually compose the encoders of all of these uh, autoencoders, the blue one, the green one, and the purple one. And even though each of them might have been fairly small, just a few layers, composing all of them together gets us a very deep network. And then we fine tune that network end to end to actually perform the tasks that we want, like classifying images. And in the early days of deep learning, this recipe was very effective because we could use this to train much deeper networks than we would have been able to with end-to-end -end backpropagation. So for a while, around 2006 to 2009, this was one of the dominant ways to train deep networks. But what happened after that is that we got a lot better at training deep neural networks end-to-end. -end. And things like ReLUs, batch normalization, and better hyperparameter tuning were really responsible for that. And once we could train these networks end-to-end, -end, then we didn't really need the layer-wise pre-training anymore. There was comparatively much less benefit to training all these autoencoders in order to initialize our very deep networks. And instead, we could simply initialize them with something like Xavier initialization, and then use uh, things like rectified linear units, which have much more well-behaved gradients, batch normalization, which improves our gradients further, and good optimizers like Atom, uh, and then just you know, spend a little bit more time tuning hyperparameters, and actually get things to work just as well, if not better, when the whole network is trained end-to-end, -end than when it was initialized with layer-wise pre-training. So it's good to know about. It's not used very much today, but uh, this is a part of the reason why you see autoencoders popping up so much in the deep learning literature. Uh, and of course, correspondingly, autoencoders became less important uh, once people figured out how to do end-to-end -end training because they didn't need to do layer-wise pre-training anymore. So uh, where are autoencoders at today? Well, they're much less widely used these days because there are better alternatives. So for representation learning, things like variational autoencoders, which are actually probabilistic generative models, which we'll learn about on Wednesday, and contrastive learning, uh, those are those have sort of supplanted more conventional autoencoders. For generation, GANs, VAEs, and autoregressive models tend to do better at generation, and you can actually sample images from them, whereas you can't sample from a denoising autoencoder or a sparse autoencoder. Um, it's still a viable option for quick and dirty representation learning, which is very fast and can work okay. You know, computationally, training a denoising autoencoder is orders of magnitude faster than training something like a pixel RNN. So if you really just need a representation really quick, um, it's kind of a decent choice. 
It's not very scalable, and there are better alternatives if you're willing to spend a little bit more time implementing things. A big problem with autoencoders, the ones that I described in the previous part of the lecture, is that sampling or generation from the autoencoder is very hard, which limits its uses. Right? So you can encode an image, get the hidden state, and then decode it, but it's very difficult to generate an image from scratch. The variational autoencoder actually addresses this, and this is the most widely used autoencoder today, so we'll cover this a lot more next time. Um, but uh, in in today's lecture, we'll, uh, what we'll ha actually have in this part uh, in this part three is a kind of introduction to latent variable models in general, which will build the foundation on which we'll uh, present variational autoencoders on Wednesday. So we won't actually describe variational auto autoencoder training today, but we will discuss the basic ideas, the basic concepts behind them, so that we can describe the training process on Wednesday. So to understand the foundations uh, of these kinds of models, we need to talk about latent variable modeling. So, uh, so far, when we talk about probabilistic models like P of X or P of Y given X, uh, the only random variables were X and Y. We had hidden states, we had uh, hidden variables like the state of the RNN, but they're not random variables. They're deterministic consequences of X. Now, if you took a, a machine learning class, like for example, CS189, you probably actually already lear learned about latent variable models, but I'll, I'll recap the basic idea here. Uh, let's say that you are doing density estimation like P of X, and your data looks like this. Now, the colors are not given to you, so as far as you're concerned, it's just a collection of points that happen to be in three clumps. The colors are just for your visualization here. Now, it's very tempting to think that a good model uh, for this kind of data wouldn't be one multivariate normal distribution, but actually three multivariate normal distribution. It looks an awful lot like a mixture model, like a mixture of Gaussians. A mixture of Gaussians is actually a latent variable model. Because when we represent a data set like this as a mixture of Gaussians, we're saying that besides the 2D coordinate of a point, there's another variable which we don't get to observe, which determines which clump it's in. And that variable is categorical, and in this case it can take on three values. There are three possible clumps, so this latent variable, unobserved hidden variable, Z, is a categorical variable with three values, representing the red, uh, magenta, and green clump. And depending on which of these clumps we're in, we would have a different multivariate normal distribution. So there is an additional random variable, but we don't observe it, which means that we have to marginalize it out. So that means that P of X is equal to the sum over all possible values of this categorical variable, all three values, of P of X given Z times P of Z. So this is a latent variable model. It is explaining the distribution in the data by introducing another variable Z that is not observed in the data set, but is nonetheless present in the generative process. So in this case, it's the mixture element. The same exact idea can be applied to conditional models. So if you have a model P of Y given X, you could say that there are actually underlying um, groups, Z, and you have a distribution over those groups. Imagine uh, the example from imitation learning going around a tree. You go around the tree left or right. Maybe the latent variable Z determines your choice. Did you go left or did you go right? Two possible values. And depending on that choice, you would have different actions, but those actions would also be conditioned on your observation. And of course, we discussed this type of model already when we talked about imitation learning, when we discussed how you could have a policy that outputs a mixture of Gaussians. Okay, but let's talk about latent variable models more generally. And this will lead up to a very powerful class of latent variable models, much more powerful than mixture, mixtures of Gaussians. Let's say that our distribution P of X is very complex. And maybe it doesn't, it's not something as simple as just consisting of three clumps. It's some really complicated, monstrous distribution. We can't represent it with a Gaussian. We can't represent it with three Gaussians. It's just some complicated function. Let's introduce another distribution over another variable Z that is very simple. So we'll say that P of Z is very simple. It's just a zero mean unit variance normal distribution, a very simple distribution. And then we'll build our generative model as a mapping from Z to X, a probabilistic mapping. So it'll say that P of X given Z is Gaussian with a mean that is some neural network function of Z, 
and a variance that is also some neural network function of z. So that means that p of x uh, is given by an integral over all possible values of z of p of x given z times p of z dz. The reason it's an integral rather than a sum is because now z is continuous. Okay, so I'm constructing this model in this way. Why am I doing it? The reason that I'm doing it in this way is because p of x is very, very complex. And learning very, very complex distributions is difficult. It is difficult to represent them. It is difficult to train them. And what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to represent p of x as a composition of two very simple distributions. One of those distributions is p of z, which is just a Gaussian. It's not even learned. It's just a fixed distribution. And the other one is p of x given z. Now, p of x given z is a simple distribution. It's a Gaussian. But its parameters, the mean and the, and the variance, are very complex functions of z. They're given by neural networks. So what I've done by choosing to represent p of x in this way is that I've offloaded most of the complexity into the mapping from z to the mean and variance of x. So the actual distributions now are very simple. The distributions are both Gaussians. But of course, the mean and variance of the, of the x Gaussian is a complicated function of z. By representing my complex distribution over x as the composition of these two relatively simple distributions, I've made it a lot easier to solve this modeling problem. So I have an easy distribution over z and an easy distribution over x. But the distribution over x is a complicated function of z. But that's okay because that function is deterministic. Right? The mapping from z to mu and the mapping from z to sigma, these are just deterministic functions. And we know how to represent deterministic functions. We do that with neural nets. So this might seem a little bit abstract, but this basic principle is very important for understanding latent variable models. And we'll learn about a variety of different latent variable models, like VAEs and GANs, but they're all basically based on this principle. That you have an easy distribution over a very abstract latent variable z, and you have an easy conditional distribution over your complicated variable x. x might be something like an image. But the mapping from z to x, z to the uh, mean and variance of x, or whatever the parameters of the distribution of x uh, are, that's represented by a neural network, and that can be complex, but it's deterministic. Great. If, if this still seems a little bit abstract, don't worry. I'm going to talk quite a bit more about this in the next few slides. Okay. How do we train latent variable models? I'm not going to give you a full recipe here. I'll just give you sort of a taste for some of the challenges. The complete recipe will be on Wednesday. So we're going to have some model, and we're going to call it p theta of x. Just like before, we had p theta of y given x. Now we have p theta of x. And we have a data set of x's. And the subscripts here now denote different data points. So it's not like in uh, language modeling where these are different words. No, each, each x here is an entire image. So x1 is an image, x2 is a different image, etc. And we train with maximum likelihood. We always train probabilistic models with maximum likelihood. So we're going to train it to maximize uh, with respect to theta the sum of, of, the, of your data set of log p theta of xi. But remember that each of your x's, each of your p of x's is an integral over all the z's, right? So p of x is equal to the integral over all z's of p of x given z times p, p of z times dz. So if you substitute this definition for p of x into the log, then you get this objective. And unfortunately, this objective is completely intractable because you can't integrate over all possible z's, right? There's no, this integral does not have a closed form solution. So instead, when we train latent variable models, uh, we need to use something a little more uh, manageable. And what we actually use in practice is something called the expected log likelihood. Um, we'll learn a lot more about the mathematical reasons for using the expected log likelihood on Wednesday. But today, I mostly just want to present a little bit of intuition. So the expression for the expected log likelihood looks like this. Instead of using log p of x, what we do is we essentially guess what the z is for every image xi, and then we use log p theta of xi comma z, where the z is our guess. So instead of trying to in integrate out z, we're actually going to guess what the z should be and then we will maximize the probability of that z with that x. And the way that we guess what the z should be is by estimating p of z given x. What's the probability of a given z given the image that we're seeing? 
under the current model. So this is called the expected log likelihood. And it makes a lot of sense. You're, you're, you're essentially saying your data set doesn't have Zs, so let's guess the Zs, fill them in, and then train the model that way. So the intuition is you guess the most likely Z given your X and pretend that it's the right one. Uh, but there are many possible values of Z, so you actually use a distribution. P of Z given Xi. Um, so then the big question, in fact the main question, for training these latent variable models is how do you estimate P of Z given Xi? And this is called probabilistic inference. There are many ways to solve this probabilistic inference problem, and we will talk about a particular, very commonly used choice on Wednesday called variational inference, but we will not talk about that today. So for today, I'm going to limit my discussion of training to this statement. In order to train a latent variable model, we need some way to estimate P of Z given Xi, and there are many different choices. But once you're able to do it, then you use P of Z given Xi to sample a Z for each Xi, and then maximize the log P theta of Xi comma Z. So uh, what, that, what the inference process basically amounts to is figuring out for a particular X, for a particular point in this uh, uh, distribution over, uh, over X, what is its corresponding distribution over Z. Okay. So that was kind of abstract. That was latent variable models in general. But let's talk about latent variable models in deep learning in particular. And I'm going to present kind of a, a less abstract, more, more mechanistic view of, the, of these things. So what a latent variable model looks like in deep learning is that there is some variable z, and z is a vector. Just like we had a vector h, now we have a vector z. It plays the same role, it's just a different letter. Uh, and it has some prior distribution p of z. Now, this prior distribution is typically set to something very simple because the meaning of z is not fixed. The meaning of z is entirely determined by your model. So you actually don't need to learn or design the p of z. You can choose something simple like a zero mean uh, identity covariance multivariate normal distribution. And then you have a decoder, just like in an autoencoder. The decoder maps vector z to distributions over x. And this is a neural network. So uh, basically a z goes in and then a distribution over x has come out uh, where the x's might correspond to, let's say, images. Using the model for generation works like this. First you sample z from p of z. And this sounds very fancy, but all it really means is like generate a vector of random numbers. Right? P of z is a, is a zero mean uh, unit variance Gaussian, so you literally just generate a vector. Maybe z has you know, 64 dimensions. You generate 64 normally distributed numbers. It's basically just like, it's like, it's like a random number generator, just a source of random numbers. Step two, sample x from p of x given z, which means that you take z, you run it through your network, and that network produces some distribution over x. So turn that vector of random numbers into an image. Now the distribution over x could be very simple. It could be something like a softmax, or it could be a Gaussian. So a latent variable generative model is usually just a model that turns random numbers into valid samples. That's really all it is. So for all the fancy math on the previous slides, mechanistically, this is all it looks like. Generate a vector of random numbers, call that z, run that through your neural network, get an image. Uh, please don't tell anyone I said this, it destroys the mystique a little bit, but that's really all it is. And VAEs, GANs, etc., they're just different ways of doing this. So there are many types of such models, VAEs, GANs, normalizing flows, etc., and mostly they differ in how these things are trained, with some minor differences in representations too. But this is the basic idea. So today we're going to talk about how to represent and use this, Whereas next time we'll, we'll talk about how to train this, and there are different ways of training it depending on whether you want VAEs or GANs or something else. Okay, so how do we represent latent variable models? Well, the easy one is how do you represent P of Z? That's really easy. Just generate Gaussian random numbers. There's nothing to learn here, nothing fancy. How do you represent P theta of X given Z? Well, this part is a little more complex. So first, how do you represent a distribution over X? Well, option one is to say that your pixels are continuous valued. Let's say that your, your, your pixels are real numbers. Then what you would typically do is you would represent it as a uh, multivariate normal distribution with a diagonal covariance, which is just amounts to saying that every pixel is going to have a mean and every pixel is going to have a variance. 
And both the mean and the variance of every pixel could in general be functions of z. So they might be the output of a neural network. Um, so uh, the mean is a neural net function and the variance is optionally a neural net function. Right? So your uh, decoder then outputs a mu and a sigma for every pixel. Very often we will simplify this and we will just make sigma be a constant. So we won't have the neural net output sigma. Sigma can be learned, just independent of z, or can even be chosen manually to be something fixed like 1, in which case you just get a mean squared error loss. Okay, so that becomes really, really simple. And that's actually a pretty common choice uh, for these kinds of models. Another option is to say that your pixels are discrete valued. And in that case, you could do something very similar to what we did for pixel RNN or pixel CNN, except that instead of having each pixel depend on every other pixel, now the pixels can be independent 256-way softmaxes because they are, they're all dependent on z. So basically, z couples the pixels together, but conditional on z, the pixels can all be independent. And this actually works very well, but it's a little bit slow. And there are other choices that we don't cover in this lecture if you want discrete distributions without having to have a giant 256-way softmax. And if you want to learn about those, look up uh, things like discretized logistic or binary cross-entropy. So they're basically simpler, computationally simpler, uh, but somewhat harder to describe ways of representing these distributions. The discretized logistic is especially common for the best performing models. Okay, um, what architecture should we use for this uh, p of x given z? We know what it's going to output. It's going to output either a softmax over each pixel or the mean and maybe the variance for every pixel. But what should the architecture be? Well, an easy choice is to just use a big fully connected network, basically a bunch of linear layers plus railers. And this was a very common choice kind of in the early days of these kinds of models. It also works well for tiny images like MNIST or for non-image data. But if you, if you have uh, more complex or larger images, a better choice is to use transpose convolutions. So if you think back to our lecture about um, computer vision, when we talked about these uh, transpose convolution architectures for fully convolutional image segmentation, semantic segmentation, you can imagine just basically using the right-hand side of that architecture to turn the vectors, the z vectors, into entire images. So you take those vectors, you uh, run them through a fully connected layer to turn them into a low-dimensional, uh, into a low-resolution convolutional map, and then you use transpose convolutions and unpooling to get the resolution up and up, up and up and up and up and up until it gets to the full resolution that you want for your final image. And that's actually a common choice for more sophisticated uh, generative models of this sort. Okay, training latent variable models. Uh, we'll talk about this again much more on Wednesday, but there are basically three basic types of choices. Choice one is to perform inference to figure out p of z given xi for each training image xi and then minimize the expected negative log likelihood. So this is what I mentioned before. Uh, and mechanically what that looks like is you sample z from p of z given xi, and then you reduce the uh, negative log probability of xi given that z with SGD. The only hard part of this is 1a, and that's what we'll talk about on Wednesday. How do you actually get p of z given xi? Uh, and this is what variational autoencoders do. Another option is to learn an invertible mapping from z to x. So you can use a special kind of neural network that maps z to x, whose inverse can be easily recovered from the neural network itself. And this is uh, used by models called normalizing flows. And we'll learn about that on Wednesday as well. And then the third choice is not to bother getting the z's for each individual x, but to match uh, the, the distributions themselves. So basically sample a z at random, sample the x given that z, and try to match those samples at the population level to the training data. And this is what is done by generative adversarial networks, or GANs. And we'll learn about how that can be done next week.